If we missed the verse, we could probably do the verse. We are on. We're definitely on. Okay. So Jesus, we're in John 7, we're in John 8 now, and uh, G, John 7 and 8, Jesus is in Jerusalem during the Feast of Booths, and there are times in the Gospel of John where John slows down, and it becomes fairly clear that I would say the careful reader can see that John 8 is still taking place, or at least most likely taking place, where John 7 was taking place. Uh, at the Feast of Booths, the argument is only briefly interrupted, but when John 7 and 8, John slows down for lengthy conversations that take place at this feast, six months before Jesus' death. And so, there is a temptation as, as a guy who kind of does this for a living, you know, who studies and writes. Like most of, most of what I do is studying and writing. <clears throat> and more studying than, than, and writing than, than, than preaching. You know, I study, I, I, I look at words in a book and I, and I write thoughts down, you know, I type thoughts down on paper and then I speak words to people. And the speaking words to people is the smallest part of what I actually do. The temptation is... Let's just kind of treat this as a unit and kind of go through, or maybe one or two messages and kind of go through it. But when John slows down and spends this much time talking about something that happened at this one feast, it is appropriate to slow down with him and see what he's writing. And so I know we've been in John 7 and 8 for a little bit, and we have a couple more weeks, I think, in John 8, probably two or three more weeks maybe in John 8. But when John slows down, important stuff is happening. We're in Jerusalem during the Feast of Booths, a feast that celebrates Israel's time in the wilderness, the exodus and the time in the wilderness, when they relied on God for food and drink, for manna and for water. And during this feast, the people have been debating who Jesus is. Is he a good man? Uh, some people think so. Is he leading people astray? Some people think so during Jerusalem in the first century. Uh, the religious leaders, they are particularly aggravated about this. They're particularly aggravated that there is a debate about Jesus because they have made up their mind that he is not good, that he's a deceiver, that he's a false teacher. They've rejected him, and they're going to do everything they can to get him to arrest him, to kill him. They've already begun to plot how they would kill him. They've already sent the temple police out to arrest him. And those temple police didn't arrest him. They weren't sure that Jesus was such a bad guy. Of course, the, the Pharisees, you know, they manip manipulated those guys, you know, and, and you know, just logical fallacies. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Last week, we were looking at Jesus' conversation with the Pharisees, and we saw that these guys, these religious leaders, the guys who are supposed to be like, the, you know, the, the most spiritual people in the land, and we talked about that. That's not always true, right? Is the pastor always the most spiritual guy? You know, was Jimmy Swaggart the most spiritual guy, right? Or Benny Hinn? You know, I don't think so. Or uh, Jim Jones? You know, we could come up with a whole list of names of guys who were spiritual leaders, but they were not spiritual, right? These spiritual leaders, the most religious, so-called religious people of the land, the most so-called spiritual people of the land, their knowledge was just, it wasn't, it was insufficient. And because they didn't understand, they couldn't judge properly. And by the way, if you don't understand scripture, you're not going to be able to make sound judgment in life. I mean, you might be able to make some wise decisions and stuff like that. You might get lucky a few times, you know what I mean? Or you might have some wisdom that gets imparted to you that you think, oh, that, that makes sense. But if you don't understand scripture and you don't understand it in its context, then you're already behind. You're already behind the eight ball. That's why we deal with context so much. Context is so important. Uh, my first pastor used to say, a text without a context is a pretext. You know, context is so important. Often gets skipped over from the pulpit. 
Uh, these religious leaders don't understand the truth because they reject the truth. And because they reject that truth, their judgment is poor and they're in trouble with God. They've rejected the Messiah. They're in trouble with God. They don't even know it. Today, this conversation turns to Jesus' authority and where his authority comes from. But this part of the conversation, and, and again, we're going to deal with Jesus' authority more so. As the rest of John 8 unfolds, we're going to deal with Jesus' authority. This part of the conversation focuses, or at least starts with a dire warning, a serious warning. And we see that in John 8 and verse 21. John 8, verse 21, just a few verses today, really, uh, verses 21 through 30 today. Then he said again to them, I go away, or I am going away, and you will seek me and will die in your sins. Where I am going, you cannot come. And so Jesus will go away, and the Jews will die in their sin. He'll go away, meaning, well, what do you think that means? What do you think it means that Jesus is going away? I mean, he's going on vacation. My parents, I had to drive my parents to the airport on Saturday. Well, you know, they made me get up at 5.45 in the morning. I don't get up at 5.45. I know Mr. Metcalf does, but he also goes to sleep at 7.45. At, no, I'm just teasing. <laughs> After he has a gl warm glass of milk, you know. Um, no, I, I, he gets up at like 2.30 in the morning. I understand that. But they maybe get up at 5.30 and take him to get on an, on an airplane. So they go on vacation. Is that what Jesus is saying? He's going to go on vacation. He's going to go to Malta and visit a Caribbean. Uh, Caribbean. <laughs> visit a Mediterranean island. What's he saying here? Is he going to go to, uh, to Rome and visit Caesar? I'm talking about his death, right? Jesus will die on a cross to pay the penalty for the sins of the world. He'll be buried in a rock-hewn tomb, and on the third day, he will rise again. That's what Jesus is talking about. And he'll ascend into heaven and sit next to his father at the right hand of God. Jesus says, I go away and you will seek me. Now, these Jews, these Pharisees, they're not going to seek after, after Jesus. They're going to seek after his body, right? They're, if they think that you know, maybe they didn't get him, they're, they're going to seek after him until they can find his body. That's what they're thinking. There are other people, of course, who will seek him in faith, but not the Pharisees, not the religious leaders, no way. They'll seek false messiahs. They'll seek after messiahs, but not Jesus. In fact, later on, they'll follow a guy named Simon Bar Kokhba to their own deaths. They're looking for the messiah, waiting for him, seeking for a messiah. In fact, even today, Jews will say, as part of a feast, as part of the uh, Passover feast, next year in Jerusalem, meaning next year Messiah. May Messiah come next year in Jerusalem. They're still looking. They're still waiting, but he's already come. And they missed it because they were blind, because they rejected God's Messiah. And so, because of that, they will die in their sin. They'll die in rebellion against God. They'll die because they were in, in, in the sin of rejecting the Messiah. And so many people, so many people are like that today. So many people will die in their sins. Maybe, uh, maybe they think they're better off than the Pharisees. You know, uh, maybe they think that Jesus is a decent man or a moral teacher or a moral example or something like that. Um, Reminds me of a guy who in one sentence curses like a sailor. And the next sentence says, let's pray. You know. I see people like that on TV sometimes. And it's just sickening. 
Maybe there are people that even believe Jesus is the Son of God. But they don't place their faith in his completed work on the cross. They trust in their own works for salvation. They trust in their own abilities or, or their own, uh, some, sa- some sacrament that will earn them grace with God. And they, like the Pharisees, will die in their sin. There was a time in my life when, had I died at that moment, or in those years of my life, I would have died in my sin. I remember one time, and I think I was, I think I was unsaved. I think this was before I became a Christian, but I'm not 100% sure I remember uh, the exact time of this. I remember I was driving, if I remember, to a Yankees game. You know, go see, go see the Yankees. And uh, something flew off a truck in front of me and came right at my face. And I immediately thought, like, this could be the end. And I, I just remember, you know, you can't, like, you swerve, you, you forget about it. I just remember ducking out of the way like that and hearing a loud crash. And then seeing nothing abnormal and pulling over to the side of the road and getting out and seeing a dent like that deep just above the windshield. So what must have happened is the, the, the wind shear, or what, I don't know what you'd call that, you know, whatever, what do you, what do you call that? Uh, you know, the, the wind that goes around the vehicle, whatever, must have just picked it up just enough, just enough to get above the, wind, the windshield and dent my, my car about that deep, right in, the, right in the corner had a big old dent and I thought, Man, if that didn't come up, I mean, maybe my windshield stops it or slows it down or whatever, but you, you read about people who something comes through and boom, they die driving in the car. And uh, I, had I still had my, uh, I had my SL1, so I think I was actually a Christian. So I would, have, I, would have, sir, I would have been in heaven if I would have died at that moment. But there are other moments in my life where God could have taken me and I would have died in my sin. The Pharisees will die in their sin. They are in big trouble with God and they've rejected the only means of their salvation. And so Jesus says, where I'm going, you cannot come. They can't come there. They're lost. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot enter God's presence. He will not inherit the promise of everlasting life because he's rejected life. This is a serious warning. And everything in the rest of this paragraph we're looking at today has to be seen in light of this warning. It's a warning that these Jews need to respond to. It's a warning that millions of people today need to respond to. It's a warning that you need to listen to. Because though you maybe have been in church for many years or many decades, you might be lost. You might die in your sin. You might need to repent. Just because you're a church-going person doesn't make you a genuine Christian. And just because your parents are church-going people doesn't make you a Christian. And by the way, it doesn't make them one either. These Jews need to repent. They need to turn away from their sin and turn towards God in faith. But look at how they respond to Jesus' warning, instead of responding in faith, instead of responding in humility, instead of responding in repentance, which is what they should have done, look how they respond in verse 22. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself. Will he? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. I mean, is he going to kill himself? Uh, okay. You'll have to excuse These Jews, they're a little slow, right? I mean, you know, how can you miss the point so badly? How can you miss that what Jesus is saying is about their souls? And it's not like some temporary thing. I talk about baseball. You know, we we lost the championship game yesterday. And and I talk to my son all the time about how, you know, I'll say things like, listen, baseball can crush your soul. 
right? Christian, you know what I'm talking about. You know, um, although at, by this time in your life, you, you, you learn how to forget. You have to have a quick memory or else it will crush your soul, right? You know, I've, I've gone 0 for 8. Am I ever going to get a hit again? You know, or something like that, right? You know, I've walked four guys in a row. Am I ever going to throw another strike? Uh, you know, it can crush your soul. But that's, that's not, you know, that's temporary. And that's, that's in the here and now. And eventually, there are things in life that, you know, crush the soul. But you, you get over it for the most part. These guys can't realize that Jesus is talking about their souls, that they're damned. And they think, all they can think of is how to twist Jesus' words to criticize him. Jesus warns them about dying in their sins, and they come away thinking Jesus is going to kill himself? Really? That's, that's your logical thinking? That's your mind? These guys need to take an IQ test, if that's what they really think. And they're not going to do very well. They're seeking to kill him. It's hard for me to read this and think that that's what they really suspect. It's hard for me to not see them just being deceivers and liars and just kind of twisting anything Jesus says to make him look bad. It's not the first time they responded this way. John 7, 35, the Jews then said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? He is not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? Is he going to go to... Uh, to the unclean Gentiles <laughs> and teach them. By the way, we're Gentiles. I mean, most of us. Jen is 50% Gentile um, and 50% Jew. So one half. I used to be one thirty-third and a third Jew, but then uh, Ancestry.com took away my Jewry, so I'm no longer a Jew. You know, I had all kinds of good jokes too, but I can't even use them now. Anyway, uh, these people should have been able to see that they were in trouble with God. They should have been able to see that they need to repent, but all they can do is belittle Jesus, completely twisting his words. And so Jesus clarifies his warning in verses 23 and 24. And he was saying to them, you, you emphasized in, uh, in this passage pretty clearly emphasized, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That's the third time we saw that statement. You will die. Can you see why this is like the main point here? When you see uh, you know, a statement like this show up multiple times, a light bulb should go off. This is something that's important. It's why I slowed down and said, this, is, this needs to be one. We need to focus on this and this alone today. This is important. These two, uh, Jesus and the Pharisees, Jesus and the Jews, they have completely different makeups. They're, they're contrasted as clearly as could be here. Completely different origins. Jesus is from above. They're from below. Jesus is from heaven. They're from this world. The, these two realms couldn't be more different. And the Jews don't even understand any of these things because they're of the world. And the world is against God. And the world hates the word of God. Look at, uh, check this out. Uh-oh, what happened here? Okay, sorry. You know you're getting old when you push a button on a computer and you think you just like destroyed the computer and all you did was like minimize something. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. Jesus said that. In this context, in this setting, back at one chapter ago at the Feast of Booths, John will later write this. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. Jesus' origins are entirely different than any mere human. Look at what John wrote right in, the beginning of the God, right in the beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Jesus is of a completely different makeup. He's of a completely different origin than any human. And these guys think they're above Jesus. They think they know better than God. 
Jesus is of the same substance and essence of God as God the Father. And because of who Jesus is, and because they reject him, they will die in their sins. Because of who man is, man will die in their sins, unless they place their faith in Jesus and in his completed work on the cross. This is true for us. We're sinners by birth and by choice. We're in trouble with God. There's nothing we could do to fix it. There's nothing we could do to fix it. There's no sacrament I can take. No, no baptism that I can be baptized with. No offering that I can make. That is like in the offering plate. No communion I can take. They can fix the situation with God. And so we're sinful and rebellious by birth and by choice. And we are destined to eternity in hell. We're in trouble with God. And if we reject God's Messiah, we will die in our sins. But there is a way out, and that will become clear throughout this gospel. There is a way out, and that is if you place your faith in the work of Christ on the cross. Jesus took your place. It's called the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement, right? You've heard that before. Now, kids, you hear the substitutionary atonement, you think those are two big words, right? But really all it means is this, that Jesus took your place and he died in your place as a sacrifice that satisfies God's wrath against your sin. He became your substitute. You're the one who deserves death. You're the one who deserves to die. You're the one who deserves to suffer. And he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The substitutionary atonement is that just Jesus died in your place and that satisfies God's wrath. If you place your faith in the work of Christ, you will be saved. You'll have everlasting life. And if you don't place your faith in Jesus, you will die in your sins. Uh, just a little, little nugget here that I want to pull out kind of like as an aside. Notice that Jesus says, unless you believe, and that's, by the way, that's the word faith. I have, a, I have an illustration. Um, uh, let me see here real quick. I didn't pull it up, but I, I, have, I have it always saved and available. for people to see that word believe in, in the English language. It's always translated believe, but in the original language, uh, you'll notice that the verb, is, uh, the verb is translated believe, but the noun is always translated faith, right? And this word believe, just in, it's, it's translated in, uh, believe in the English Bible, but it really should be, the meaning is to place your faith in something. The meaning is to place your faith in something. And here, it's pretty clear what that something is. Uh, unless you believe, you place your faith in this fact. What is the content of that faith at that time? That I am he. Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins now. Now, um, these Jews will understand this statement beyond, like Jesus is saying he's the Messiah here, but perhaps more, perhaps more, because God uses this terminology about himself at least six times in Isaiah. Here's just a few of them. Check this out. Who has performed it and accomplished it, calling forth the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am he. And, you know, we don't know for sure that this is the connection that's being made, but if you read John 8 through the end of the chapter, it's hard to miss that. Because by the end of the chapter, they're recognizing that Jesus is claiming to be God, and they want to kill him because of it. All right, so... They're taking it as some type of divine claim. Check this out. Uh, even from eternity, I am he, and there is none other who can deliver out of my hand. I act, and who can reverse it? Uh, Isaiah 48, 12, last one in Isaiah. There's, there's a few more. Listen to me, O Jacob, even Israel, whom I called. I am he. 
I am the first. I am also the last. Now, these Jews may not have quite picked up on it yet. Again, by the end of the chapter, they will understand that Jesus is claiming to be equal with God. He's claiming to be God. Uh, by verse 58, it is as clear as can be, and we'll look at that in the next couple of weeks. Anyway, the, the Pharisees hear this, and they, they question who Jesus claims to be. Uh, verse 25, so they were saying to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, what, I have, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? You know, they're not, by the way, they're not trying to figure out who Jesus is. They're trying to figure out who Jesus claims to be. They already believe they know who Jesus is. They've already made their minds up. They already believe that he's a false teacher. So they're not trying to figure out who he is. They're trying to figure out who he claims to be. And so Jesus, having given them the dire warning already, goes on to clarify who he is. Jesus said to them, What have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. Jesus hasn't skirted around this issue about who he is. He's made it clear who he is. They just don't believe it. They simply won't accept it. They won't accept what he teaches either. Jesus is teaching what the Father says. He's speaking these things which he heard from the Father. Jesus is the Father's perfect representative. He has Check this out. All the authority of his father. And we see that right in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He speaks with the authority of God. We see this very clearly in this passage. Uh, reject it. Uh, part of his teaching is that the world is evil and the Pharisees are leaders of that. Uh, system in Israel. And so Jesus will judge them. He has judgment to do, it says in this passage. He has judgment to do. Uh, he has many things to speak and to judge concerning them, but these guys reject him. Look at verse 27. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. They're completely lacking. They did not realize. They rejected. They did not accept what Jesus said. They rejected the facts, and thus they will die in their sins. They have no spiritual discernment whatsoever. Why? Because they're not spiritual. They're lost. It's just like what the Apostle Paul would later write to a very weak, by the way. I know some, some denominations out there think that the Corinthians are the examples that we should follow. <laughs> Are you kidding me right now? Just read the book. It's like they need 1 Corinthians for dummies. Like, and what that is is just 1 Corinthians. Just read it. You know what I mean? And you could figure out these guys aren't the example to follow. Right? These guys are weak and they're immature and they've got problems like crazy. And if you don't figure that out, then you might, you might really take heed to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2.14. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He doesn't get the, the lost person doesn't get spiritual truth. And he cannot understand the things of God because those things are spiritually appraised. Lost people don't understand, they don't understand spiritual truth. So by the way, don't go seeking spiritual advice from lost people. Every once in a while I'll talk to someone and say, oh, you know, my counselors are suggesting this. And I'd say, who are your counselors? You're talking to your pastor right now. I want to know who these counselors are. All right, you know, oh, oh, some secular, some secular counselor who got a degree in Freudian thought, you know what I mean? Or, uh, or, 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 or who studied Skinner or Rogers or one of those guys? Oh, I study those guys too, and it's all a fraud. They don't know, they don't understand spiritual truth. They can't fix your problem. Your problem is a problem of the soul. Psychology means, you know what psychology means? The study of the soul. Well, that's what it originally meant. Well, do you think lost people have the answer for problems of the soul? We're talking about the sufficiency of Scripture when it comes to psychological thought. Is the Bible everything you need for life and godliness? If it is, then you have everything you need for life and godliness. If it's not, then you need psychology. And that's fact. That's fact. And every 
Bible preacher and every theologian, conservative theologian would understand that. So don't make close friendships with the world and don't seek advice from, so seek, don't, don't figure out how to figure, don't try to figure out your spiritual problems, the problems of the soul, the care of the soul. Don't entrust that to lost people or lost friends. Anyway, uh, Jesus has warned the Jews and the Pharisees. He's told them who he is, and they don't understand it because they reject him. But soon enough, they're going to understand who he is, and it's going to be undeniable. Uh, Look at verses 28 and 29. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, when you lift him up on the cross, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. That I am the one. And I do nothing of my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. When Jesus is lifted up on the cross, he will be glorified. And he will return to the glory that he had with with the Father before the foundations of the world. And he will be in paradise that very day, but one day he comes back to judge the world, and at that day, everyone will realize who he is, and many will die in their sins. Jesus is the Messiah of God who came to do what the Father planned, and he can do nothing on his own initiative. It's words that he's spoken, these are words that he's spoken several times already. In John 5, 19, Jesus answered and was saying, truly, truly, I say unto thee, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. In uh, just a few verses later in that chapter, in verse 30, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The Son has been with the Father since eternity past, and he continues to be with him, even as Jesus is speaking here in the Feast of Booths in John 8. Jesus says and does exactly what God tells him to say and do. He says and does that which is pleasing to the Father. He is the perfect God-man, the one who knew no sin. And these are bold statements that Jesus is making here in uh, in uh, verses 28 and 29, statements that very clearly speak that he is the Messiah and more. The Pharisees are going to hear these words. And by the end of the chapter, they want to kill him. By the end of this episode, they want to kill him. They want to stone him right then and there. But there are a lot of other people. And those people, the, 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 the people like the Pharisees, they're going to die in their sins, but there are a lot of other people who see Jesus differently. They have an entirely different response to who Jesus is. People like the ones we see in verse 30. And he, as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. All along, there are people who believe what Jesus is saying. Some of them, some of these people have a faith that's suspect, and we'll see that over the next rest of this gospel. But here we see uh, people, perhaps some of whom would devote their lives to following him. Many who uh, place their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. In this passage, we have a dire warning. Uh, that Jesus gives, you will die in your sins. He makes it clear that he's the Messiah, the Son of God. He makes it clear that he's more than that. And he's beginning to show the world that he is the God-man and that he will judge the world in righteousness. The Pharisees reject all of that. They rejected Jesus' warnings. They reject who Jesus is. As a result, they will die in their sins. They'll be damned to hell suffering for all eternity. In fact, that's where they are right now. I would ask you, before we close this part of our service, what about you? What will your response be? Will you place your faith 
and the completed work of Christ on the cross? Will you listen to Jesus' warnings? Will you accept that he is the God-man? Will you accept that he will judge the world in righteousness? Will you be saved? And if you're already saved, and you know, this is a small church, and a small church like this, the assumption is that most of the people here, and maybe it's a wrong assumption, but the assumption is most of the people here understand the gospel and are saved. Otherwise, why would they stay and listen to me talk? You know what I mean? Like, you know, there's a, a whole lot of other guys that have a whole lot of self-help messages that would probably be a lot more interesting to you than sitting down and examining a passage of scripture. My assumption is that most of the people in this room are saved. But just because you're saved doesn't mean that you're spiritual. If you're already saved, will you devote your life to following him? Will you put aside your love for the world and the things in it? Will you commit to worship, to fellowship, to discipleship, to evangelism? Will you follow him until your dying day? Will you glorify him with your life? Will you offer it as a sacrifice to him? Or will you continue to make spiritual compromises? And you know how that works, right? It doesn't work. You don't get from zero to 100 in like a second. You know, it starts with one little compromise and it leads to the next little compromise. And that second the compromise wouldn't have happened if the first compromise wasn't made, right? Because, you know, then the third little compromise. And by the time you get to like the 10th compromise, when you were at zero, you would have looked at the 10th compromise and said, no way, I will never be there. But it's like the old, uh, what is it, the frog in the boiling pot of water or something like that. Turn the heat up just a little bit at a time. And before you know it, he's dead. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's actually true. I think it's true. I don't know if it's true or not. I'm no expert on frogs, but um, that's, how, that's how compromise works. You know, just, just will you will you stop making spiritual compromises for the things of this world today, or will you, like the Pharisees, reject him? Will you deny the truth of God or ignore it? And again, little by little, move Jesus out of more and more of your life. Until one day, he has that tiny little, tiny little spot, you know, up in the corner cupboard, which you barely ever open. Jesus is the Messiah of God who will judge the world. You need to place your faith in his completed work on the cross and you will be saved or you will die in your sins. You need to commit your life to his service. You need to commit your life to following him. But if you reject him, you will spend eternity paying the price. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes for a brief moment of invitation. No one looking around, just you, me, and God. Um, you're here today, and you, you're not sure that you're saved. If you could just kind of either one of two things, either raise your hand up uh, for me to know, or just, just look at me, and I'll kind of look around. I'm not sure that I'm saved. I'm not sure that I'm going to heaven when I die, but I'd like to be sure. If you, just, you, if you do one of those things, just raise your hand up a little bit, or just look at me, and I'll see, and I'll pray for you privately. I see that. I see that. You're here, and you know you're saved, but you also know that you've begun to make spiritual compromises in your life, and your walk isn't quite what it once was, and you want to recommit to following the Lord. You want to recommit to discipleship and to commitment to, to him. Would you just uh, raise your hand up for me? I'd like to pray for you privately. I'm not going to tell anyone about it. I'm, I just want to pray for you. I want to, I want to recommit my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I see that hand. Amen. You can put that hand down. I see that hand. Anyone else? I, I'm convicted today 
I want to recommit to following the Lord. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you that you are the great God, and there is none other. Uh, You are he. You are the one. We thank you that there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved besides your name and the name of your son, Jesus Christ. I pray for these who are unsure of their salvation. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to convict and that you would help them to understand your gospel and be saved. And I pray for these others and perhaps others who didn't raise their hand that you would continue to work conviction and that you would empower them through uh, your Holy Spirit so that they can um, take up their cross and follow you and um, more than they have. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you take your hymnals and turn to 328, we are going to close our service with an hymn.